freaking nervous. The whole world is watching. The course of human history has changed today. The ship appears to be stopping over Johannesburg City. They're spending so much money to keep them here when they could be spending it on other things. At least they're keeping them separate from us. How do your weapons work? Thank you all for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed the film. For those of you who don't know, uh, Neil, you grew up in South Africa. Um, and for those of you who also don't know, there's a short film that preceded this. Now, does that feel to you that that's something that you wished you could have made differently? I mean, did you feel that there's a better version of that that you could and should go off well, and make? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of a complicated question. I mean, when I made a Lyman Joberg, it never occurred to me that it could be a feature film. There was no reason for doing it other than creativity. So I made it, and I put it on a shelf. And then um, when the idea to turn it into a film came up, it felt incredibly sort of invigorating. So it's kind of a weird, it didn't occur to me when I was making it, but if someone pointed it out to me, it seemed like an obvious, an obvious direction to go. Terry, as you're writing, you're obviously dealing with an a incredibly, I mean, it's an alien movie, but it's about oppression. It's a very serious subject, given the political context. As you're writing, um, how do you balance, I hate to use the word entertaining in, in a trivial way, but that the movie, even if it's politically important and is addressing a serious issue does not feel as oppressive as the oppression you're trying to chronicle? Well, I, I think it actually took us a while to, to find that balance. We were very serious at first and taking ourselves a bit too serious. And then the satire sort of became the focus after we were serious and we kind of had fun with it. And we amused ourselves with the cat food and, and things like that. It, I mean, it's, you can find humor in anything and we kind of do in life. That's how we get through tragedy a lot of the time. The beginning part of the movie was, was we were approaching it from a place that was too serious. And uh, one day I woke up and like I actually wrote across our wall, I wrote satire in massive letters on like A4 paper and stuck it to the wall. And that's when, I, that's when District 9 kind of worked in my mind. I'm curious if it was uncomfortable or unusual to be a first time feature filmmaker working with Peter Jackson who obviously has a great body of work, distinct point of view. He always let me make the film that I wanted to make, which was very cool of him. But he was... Uh, very clear about what he thought would work and what he thought w would not work. And the good part about that was he put the pressure on me. You know, if you think this is going to work, then I'll trust you. You'll have to go off and make sure that that works. And sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it does. But I felt the pressure was on me. For those of you who don't know, you made this movie for $30 million, which is an extraordinarily uh, little amount of money given what you're trying to do visually. You certainly can't imagine anything and then and then execute it. It, it. It's more a case of, of working backwards. So if you, if, you have, if you have a limited budget, like for instance, the design of the creatures, they're, they're exoskeletal and they have like a hard surface um, shell. It's much easier to achieve an as exoskeletal a creature, yeah. As, as a, it Just is, because as you can a, light it be better? Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. And the deformations, you know, like the folds and skin and everything, that you don't have to deal with that. So because I have a background in visual effects, I kept making those decisions all the way along the, uh, you know, the entire assembly process, knowing that we had limited amounts of money. The documentary oh. style, is that, is that a, a choice that was made um, because you thought the device of having the documentary and the, and the CCTV footage would advance the story, or is it because you can hide stuff and in some ways you can shoot no, no, faster? No, it's, it's definitely about the story first. I mean, I'm a science fiction nut, and I want to see science fiction presented in a realistic way. That's what I want to see, and I think directors make films that they want to watch. So I wanted to see a science fiction film that felt real, and something that feels real to me feels like it has news footage and CCTV footage and you know, all of the kinds of documentary footage and stuff that we associate with realism. Will there be a sequel? And will you have something to do with it if it's going to happen? I would love to go back to the world of District 9 and work more on it, whether it's a sequel or a prequel or whatever. We had, I think, literally about five days before we finished editing. I realized that we'd written something and shot something which looked like it might be perfect for a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> we hadn't thought about that at all, which is very strange. I wonder if there's any literary material or any movies that you grew up with that in some way were in your subconscious that you found yourself referencing as you're putting this film together. I can't point to one thing, but Kubrick's, you know, 2001 and, and uh, Clockwork Orange was a massive influence on me. And then all of James Cameron's stuff and Ridley Scott's, 
you know, obviously Alien and Blade Runner. And then artwork had as much effect on me as written stories or films, like Chris Foss's artwork and like even the covers of like science fiction novels and stuff. Given the incredible influences that you had and you know the films that were very important to you growing up, I think what's amazing about District Nine is that it stands as a complete original work. And thank you guys for coming and thank you guys for making the yeah, movie. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you.